Uh, we, we couldn't, I couldn't do this without them. And, uh, you know, most people look at me and think I'm the one that keeps this running. No, I'm just the one that gets all the credit, but it's not me. I'm thankful for all of the volunteers and all the staff that helps me uh, because I couldn't get up here and do what I do without an anointed worship team and without people that take care of our kids and do this kind of stuff. So I'm so thankful. Um, I want you to get your Bibles, and I'm just going to go ahead and warn you. We're taking a break just this Sunday from our Names of God series because um, I, I don't know how else to explain it, but I have just felt restrained by the Lord, uh, by the Spirit, to bring this word to you today. Uh, I, I felt under obligation. Um, I tried to get away from it. You can ask Taylor, um, some of those that are close to me. I, I tried to find something else just because uh, I am aware that what I'm going to delve in today is, is <laughs> most churches are too afraid to do it, but I, I'm not. Amen. And so I want you to get your Bibles, and we're just going to read one passage of Scripture. I've got a bunch of others, but one passage, 1 Corinthians 14, 8. And um, as you get to your Bibles, I'm going to go ahead and pray. And if you have a free hand, I want you to just stretch one hand this way. Ask the Lord to use me. Ask, uh, ask Him to hide me behind His anointing because uh, I want to say what He wants me to say. So, Father, I thank You for the Word. God, I, I, I feel the obligation. I feel the weightiness, Lord, of this Word today. And God, I'm asking you that you will allow everyone who is in this sanctuary and everyone who is going to watch this later. God, I ask you to let them have receptive spirits. Lord, I rebuke every spirit of offense. I rebuke every confusing spirit. I rebuke everything that would cause them to, to take what I'm going to say in, in a wrong way. That God, nobody can misinterpret me. Nobody can misquote me. And Lord, I pray that even if they don't agree, that Lord, they will hear me from a spirit of love and concern. Lord, today I pray that you would hide me behind your cross. And Lord, that your anointing would be on me. I cannot do this without the anointing of the Holy Spirit, Lord. I pray that you would apply your blood to my mind, to my spirit, to my words, so that, God, this word can go forth with power and with anointing and with great transformation. Lord, today, let me stand in this sacred desk and please you and nobody else but you, Lord. I thank you today for your word. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Today I'm going to do something I don't typically do, and I'm going to enter in what I call the shark-infested waters of politics. Come on. You know it is. Don't even act like it's not. There are landmines everywhere when we start discussing this. There, we're all divided. We're all divided on it, and it, it is such a divisive subject that any time we start to discuss it, the conversation soon becomes toxic. Because everybody's chosen their candidate, they've chosen their side, they've chosen who they're going to vote for and what they're going to do, and they're so loyal to that candidate or so loyal to that side that they're willing to go to any extreme necessary to stay loyal, even getting rid of family members, severing friendships and all that kind of stuff to stay loyal to their party and to their candidate. And what's the biggest problem that the reason why I feel sort of obligated and restrained to do this is the division that is in the culture has entered into the church. We're divided on different political sides. We've chosen this one, we've chosen that one, and we try, most of the time, we try to keep it out of the house of God because we know how divisive it can be. And the biggest divisive issue amongst all of it is how should a Christian vote? Now, I know that when I mention this whole subject of politics, you all got uneasy. And the reason I know that is because only two or three said, Amen. <laughs> I know that. I'm going to go ahead and ease your mind and tell you I'm not going to use this as an opportunity to endorse my candidate. I'll tell you who I'm voting for after. But that's not what this is for. Yeah. I'm, not, I'm not an advocate. Let me just go ahead and tell you, I'll say it in the end, neither one of them are perfect. Amen. Neither one of them are perfect. And if we're voting for a perfect leader, then we are seriously in trouble. Amen. Neither one of them are, are perfect. But I, I know that today... Um, I, I, I've come today with this sense of obligation because some people say that politics shouldn't be in the pulpit. I have to respectfully disagree because 1 Corinthians 14.8 says this. Let me get my little clicker working. For if the trumpet makes an uncertain sound, who will prepare 
for battle. The problem with this whole claim that politics doesn't belong in the church house is too many Christians have been led astray because they have not had a godly influencer, a godly a spokesman to lead them in the way that they should handle the subject of politics and current events. Lord help me today. Pastors have been stifled. We have been intimidated because we've been told if we talk about it too much, then people will leave our churches, people will take us off the internet, and we've been backed into a corner and been told to stand down. And I'm going to go ahead and make it known to you, I am not mad. I do not hate anybody. I don't want anybody to suffer, anybody to fail. But let me tell you, I am sick and tired of injustice, unrighteousness, and evil being shoved down our throats and us being expected to stand here and just let it happen. I'm not going to be a coward about it because Revelation 21 8 says the cowards will be thrown into the lake of fire. I'm going to be courageous today. I'm not bowing. I'm not backing down. I'm stepping up. I'm going to bring you the truth today and I'm not apologizing for it. I'm not going to mince words. I'm not going to beat around the bush. I'm going to feed you straight facts because it's time for the church to stand up and if we don't have the truth then we don't know what to stand for. I made it my solemn obligation that if you're in this house, if you belong to this church, if you are under the influence of my ministry, you will not be led astray. And if it is, if you are, it's on you, not on me. Today I'm not backing down, I'm not apologizing, I'm, I'm going to give you straight facts. And my, my goal for today is to give you a biblical platform and hopefully provide you with a biblical answer to the question of how should a Christian vote? Now, before we do that, we have to talk about the perspective of voting because whether we realize it or not, we have a jaded perspective when it comes to politics because most of us choose our side or choose our candidate based on our own personal worldview. Now, a personal worldview is influenced by opinions. Your personal worldview is your opinion on a matter. And you choose which party, which candidate you endorse based on how much they agree with your personal world, worldview. And that's how we've approached politics. But can I tell you that that is the most inappropriate perspective we can take because that's not how God intended for us to approach the subject of government and politics. Right. See, God desires for us to approach this subject from His point of view and not our own. Because God is concerned about one thing and one thing only, and that is His glory and His kingdom and the expansion of His kingdom in this earth. Amen. See, God has a kingdom perspective, and He desires that we as His people have the same perspective as He does. Are you with me this morning? See, if, I, if you were to come to me today and you were to say, Brother Drake, my family is in shambles. We're falling apart. We don't know what to do. My godly counsel, in my mind, what I would do, I'd open up the scriptures, we'd identify the problem, and I'd give you a biblical solution for it. If, if you came to me in your personal life and said the same thing, again, I'd open up the word and I'd tell you, here's your problem, here's the biblical solution for it. If the church was in shambles and the leadership says, we've got to do something, what do we do? We're going to open up the Bible. We're going to identify the problem and we're going to apply a biblical solution to it. You want to know why that is? It's because the Scripture is the ultimate foundation of truth. The Scripture has answers for every problem that we are facing today. If you want to solve your problem, you've got to know the Word because the Word is God's authoritative answer to every problem in our life. See, there are two answers for your problem, other people's answers and God's answers. And when those two things conflict, God is right and everybody else is wrong because Romans says God is true and every man is a liar. Yes, amen. Yes. Yes, See, I would approach it with Scripture, but this begs the question, what do we do when it comes to politics? What do we do when you've got Republicans slandering Democrats and Democrats slandering Republicans and people against the police and anarchy and all this stuff going on in the nation? What do you do? Well, the problem is most Christians change books. I told y'all I'm coming for you today. 
I, the problem with politics is we, we think, well, God's word's good enough to solve our personal problem. It's good enough to solve our family problem. It's good enough to solve our church's problem, but it's insufficient to solve our nation's problem. Can I tell you that is not the reality? Because if the Bible can restore a life, if it can restore a church, if it can restore a marriage, then it can restore a nation. If the word can speak to my problem, it can speak to the nation's problem. Let me tell you the reason why we're in the chaos and the mess that we're in is because we have thrown God's book out. We've ignored his precepts. We've done away with his word and that's why our nation is going to hell in a handbasket because we need the word. See the same book that can restore families, the same book that can restore a nation. God did not tell us to find another direction. See, because we have changed books and we've taken on a Republican mentality or a Democratic mentality, that's why we're in chaos. Listen to this. In the church's refusal and unwillingness to follow the divine order of God, we have failed. And in our failure, we have produced a failing culture. You want to know why the nation is in trouble? It's because the church has been too weak need. We have been too intimidated. We have been too nervous. And I'm sick and tired of a manby pamby church that won't stand up and won't speak out. I am ready for us to take back our nation as God intended it. See, if we're going to see God intervene in our affairs then we've got to change our perspective and return to Him. And that doesn't just mean by believing in Him. No, we've got to take on His precepts and His policies. Are you hearing me this morning? See, God wants to be involved in every area of our life, and that includes our vote. See, the way we cast our ballot on Tuesday should be in accordance with God's perspective and God's main concern. And his main perspective and his main concern is his glory and the expansion of his kingdom. The scripture tells us the kingdom is the Lord's and he rules over what? The nations. The Lord has established his throne in heaven and his kingdom rules over how many? All. He is a kingdom. He is a king. And his kingdom includes nations. And those nations include America. And that includes how we vote. Listen to me. If you are a Christian and you claim the name of Jesus Christ, you cannot leave God out of your vote. Amen. Yes, that's right. God? Yes, come on. Amen. So you only get to vote according to his kingdom and his glory and the expansion of it. Now this raises the question. Well, how would God vote? Well, let me go ahead and tell you, he's not voting on Tuesday. He's not. But if he wants to vote, how would he vote? Well, let's look at this from John. And I'm laying a foundation, so and I, I'm, I'm going to try not to be long to break loaves and fishes, but I'm also not going to limit myself. I've worked way too hard on this this week. I'm going to wear myself out preaching. And if you need to go, God bless you as you go. But I'm going to lay it out because I'm going to sleep good tonight. Amen. So if, how would God vote? What's his political position? Well, Joshua, I'm not going to read all of it, but when they entered the promised land, it said that the, 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 the host of the Lord's armies was before Joshua. And Joshua basically said, who are you for? Are you for them or are you for us? He would have said in our modern terminology, are you a Republican or are you a Democrat? Mm -hmm. And look at how he responded. He said, no. No. He said, I'm not for either of you. Y'all ain't ready to hear this. He said, no. He said, I'm not for you and I'm not for them. Listen, just because you're a Christian doesn't mean that God supports your political decision. Amen. Because he is not, he is not concerned with how the Republicans do and how the Democrats do. He is not concerned with advancing their agenda. He is concerned with advancing his own agenda. Amen. Yes, he, is. he said, I'm not for either of you. 
Listen, he, he said, basically what the angel of the Lord said, I did not come to take sides, I came to take over. I did not come to choose right or choose left. I came to call the shots. Listen to me this morning. The God of the Bible does not ride on the backs of donkeys or elephants. He does not ride on the backs of Republicans, Democrats, Independents, or Libertarians. He is his own independent. He is his own person. He votes kingdom every time. That means he always votes for himself. Amen. See, this is the perspective that Christians should take. We should be kingdom independents. That means we are not so loyal to our party that we will neglect the truth of Scripture. I think that bears repeating. We are not so loyal to our party that we will ignore evil, that we will ignore injustice, that we will ignore people spitting in the face of God. We are, we are loyal to one, and that is Jesus Christ, Lord of Lords, King of Kings, the soon coming Redeemer. Yes, amen. Yes, amen. That means when we cast our vote, we vote according to God's standards. That means on Tuesday, we choose the one that lines up with his policies. See, if we're going to vote with God, then we've got to vote according to his policies. We've got to choose the party or the candidate. Because listen, while his policies don't include siding with one side or the other, they do involve us choosing the one candidate or the side that closely resembles what he stands for. Yes, amen. Yes. Now, God's not voting on Tuesday. He's not casting a ballot. But if he was to vote, if he was to write in what he would vote for, he'd vote for his policies. And we're going to talk about some of the issues. Because, see, we've got to vote according to the issues that God would vote for or against. Are y'all with me? Yes, amen. If God was voting on Tuesday, he'd vote in favor of life. Genesis 1, 1 and 26, and God created them in his image. Holy Spirit, I need your help. Every person, white, black, Hispanic, yellow, whatever, was created in the image of God. They were stamped with His divine design. Yes, amen. That means every life is important to Him. Yes, it is. Amen. That means every person has a destiny. Yes. Amen. That means every individual, no matter where they were born, what family they were born into, they have a divine design from God Almighty. Yes, amen. See, God is the one who created life. Mankind was created in his image. All of life from womb to tomb is important to God. And he sees all life as sacred because all life was stamped with his image. Yes, amen. So understand this. Anytime a life is taken illegitimate, illegitimately, God views it as a personal insult. Mm. Come on. Any time a life is taken illegitimately, whether by murder, suicide, genocide, or abortion, God takes it as a spit in the face. Yes, he does, Why? Because when we take a life illegitimately, we are in essence telling God what you created was not worth protecting. Y'all ain't ready for this. He created us in his image. All life is sacred to God. This is one of the biggest schisms in politics today. You've got everybody taking sides on the issue. Some people say abortion is fine all the way up until birth. There's some people that say that abortion is wrong no matter the circumstances. Then you've got those people who like to straddle the fence who say, well, it depends. It depends on whether it was incest or rape or whether this or whether that. And it has caused an argument. But can I tell you, this should not be a discussion at all, especially in the church. Amen, brother. Because God has made his position clear. 
Psalm 139 says, You formed my inward parts. You covered me in my mother's womb. I will praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. You know my ways, because I was, you, with your skill, you created me, and my days are written in your book. Look again what it says in Job. Your hands made me and fashioned me, and you knit me together with bone and sinew. Psalms again says, you are he who took me out of the womb. You made me trust while on my mother's breast. I was cast upon you from birth, from my mother's womb. You have been my God. In Matthew chapter 1, the angel of the Lord recognized that Mary was pregnant with a baby. Not a blob, not a clump of cells, but a baby. Scripture is clear that that which is in the womb is life. Life begins at conception. God is so concerned with life that the scripture tells us he gave us a destiny before we were ever conceived in the womb. It said the Lord called me from the womb and formed me to be his servant. Jeremiah 1.5 Before I was formed in the womb, you knew me. I was sanctified to be a prophet. God gives us a destiny before our daddy's sperm and our mama's egg comes together. We were destined before we got in the womb and we're destined in the womb. And any time a government says it's okay to abort a baby, they are insulting God. Yes, they are. Come on. And let me tell you, we as God's people have to protest that. I don't care if you like this or not. I don't care if you agree with me or not. Abortion is murder in its most gruesome form. That is a life. No matter how big or how small, it is a person made in the image of God. See, God will always vote in favor of life. Always. Because he created life. He destined life. And according to Scripture, the job of civil government is to protect life. Now, you've got people that argue, well, it's not the government's job to tell me what I can and cannot do. Y'all have heard this phrase, my body, my choice. Can I tell you that's the most asinine statement you can make? How stupid is that statement? Let me tell you why. Number one, all life comes from God. You didn't create nothing. Number two, I don't mean to be gruesome, but I'm going to lay it out straight. If you're, a, if you're pregnant with a boy, there are parts in you that don't belong to you. Amen. Yeah. Right, come on. Do I have to be explicit? No, Number three, that genetic makeup of that baby is different from you. That's not your body. Number four, the government tells you what you can do with your body all the time. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Jerry, I wouldn't do this. But let me go get drunk tonight and drive down Highway 41 and get pulled over. And when they want to take me to jail for a DUI, you know what I'm going to say, Cecil Ray? Well, it's my body, my choice. <laughs> I told y'all I'm coming for Come you. Come on, brother. Come for us. <laughs> I can do what I want to in my butt. How stupid. Amen. Come on, man. Preach, Let somebody rape a little girl and use that as their excuse. How far you think they're going to get with it? As Christians, we cannot support this stupid statement, my body, my choice. It's not your body. You didn't create your body. God created your body. First Corinthians tells us you are not your own. Whether you're saved or whether you're unsaved, he bought you. Amen. He shed his blood for you. You do not belong to yourself. Therefore, you cannot make your own decisions according to what you want to do. Amen. We do not have autonomy over our bodies. It's not my body, my choice. It's God's body, God's choice. Amen. And God will choose life every time. Yes, he will. Yes, he will. <sighs> See, God always votes in favor of life. He is 100%. Listen to me and listen to me clear. 
He is 100% against abortion regardless of the circumstances. That may sound that may sound insensitive, but it's not. Hear me and hear me well. I hate those people that were that were subjects of rape. I, my heart breaks for them. But just because that baby was a product of a man's stupid decision does not mean it deserves to die. Just because some sick-minded individual raped his niece or raped somebody doesn't mean that baby deserves to suffer for their decision. You don't know what sort of destiny God could have for that baby. He is 100% against the taking of innocent lives. Call it health care if you want to, but it's the only form of health care where one of the party dies. You want to know how to vote on Tuesday? As a kingdom citizen, you are obligated to vote for life. And God will not hold you guiltless if you don't. He'd vote for life. Number two, he'd vote in favor of the family. The family was God's first form of government. The family was here before government ever existed. Adam and Eve, that was the first government. He gave us as man and woman a duty to rule and reign over the earth. Can I tell you that it was actually not God's will that mankind have civil government? Go read 1 Samuel. When they asked for a king, read it. They asked for a king so we can be like the other nations. That's what it said. And when Samuel was upset, God said, Samuel, they have not rejected you. They've rejected me. God never intended us to be part of a civil government. His design was for us to rule under his ruling. But we have it. That's the sad reality of our world. We have civil government. But before civil government was the foundation and institution of family. And when God established the family, he used it as the foundation on which civilization and society would be ordered and properly built. So when the foundation of the family is cracked, the well-being of society breaks down. When the family breaks down, the nation breaks down. When people choose to redefine marriage and redefine family, don't be surprised when chaos enters society. That's what happened in Genesis 6 with Noah. It said that Noah and his family were the only pure ones on the earth. They were the only ones who had not partaken in relations outside of the marriage covenant. See, the family's not a small deal to God because the breakdown of the family institutes the breakdown of society. See, when government works against the definition of family and marriage, they undermine God's purpose, and then we can be sure the nation will fail. See, God created the family, and He only warranted it when we use it for its intended design. We got new windows on the back of the church. They look great. If you hadn't seen them yet, please go see them. There's a window in that nursery right there. And we have an air condition unit we wanted to put in the day they finished. But the guy that installed it told us this, Sister Teresa, don't put it in for two weeks because you might cause, the da- you might cause damage to the window. And if you damage it, the warranty is null and void. See, when we choose to redefine marriage, we nullify the warranty God placed on it. That's right. Come on. Come on. Preach, God only warrants the family to operate the way he intended it to operate. That's right. So God will always vote in favor of the family. So what would he vote for? He would vote for traditional marriage. Genesis 2.24, a man shall leave his father and his mother and cleave unto his wife. Yes, amen. Yes. Y'all aren't going to like this. The Bible has nothing to support same-sex marriage. Amen. 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 Amen.
there's nothing in the scriptures that would support the covenant between a man and a man or a woman and a woman. Some people would say, well, Jesus never addressed it. He actually did. In Matthew 19, he starts talking about marriage and divorce. And if you'll read it, he always talks about man and woman. Well, Brother Drake, that didn't mention homosexual marriage. No, because it wasn't an option. Amen. That's right. If he would not, if he would not support and if he would not justify polygamy, incest, and uh, uh, relations outside of marriage, because those were never an option, neither is same-sex marriage. See, the scriptures never give any justification for the support, for the support of the union between same genders. But I'm going to make a bold statement right here. And I told you I'm not mad, and I'm not mad at the people. But this next statement gets me riled up. This next thing gets me real aggravated because it's affecting the next generation. And I'm going to make a bold statement. You may tell you what's more dangerous to our society than same-sex marriage? That is the LGBTQ plus transgender agenda. Yes. Now, I love everybody. I love every soul. I would ne again, I would never wish ill on anybody. And it's a free country. Live how you want. But I've got to preach you the truth. And if God was voting on Tuesday, he would vote in favor of marriage, which means he would also vote in favor of traditional gender roles. Because it says, let me, I'm going to explain that in a minute. Genesis 1.27, he created them male and female. I might as well. If you don't know what gender you are, get in the shower and look down. <laughs> It's simple. God created us differently. Yes. Amen. Amen. But we've got this stupid agenda that they're telling everybody, you can choose what you want to be. And because of that, we've got men entering women's locker rooms and molesting women and beating them up. Oh. We've got men Competing in women's sports and winning. Well, duh. Men have more stamina for certain things than women do. What do you expect? And God forbid somebody speak out against it, then it's hate speech. But you know what irks me even more, Betty? It's not that they're coming for me and you. They're coming for our babies. Look at this stupid, nasty book. This, I hope every one of the, I hope wherever they, they publish this burns to the ground because this is a nasty, stupid book. This book, listen, is targeted towards middle school children. And in this book, God helped me and cleanse my eyes for reading the preview of it on Google. But on Google, it's telling children you can choose your own gender. You may be a little boy, but you might feel like a little girl. You can be pansexual, asexual, bisexual, non-binary, binary, general fluid, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J, K, L, M, N, P, all this other good kind of stuff. And it's saying you don't have to follow the rigid rules of society. You choose what you want to be. And if you're a little boy and you like little boys, that's okay. If you're a little girl and you like little girls, that's okay. If you're a little girl and you like both genders, that's okay too. You can choose what you want. And this is in our schools all across the nation. There's another nasty book that somebody sent me yesterday. It's the first book marketed towards children talking about transgender pregnancy. Based on a true story, God help us. Again, marketed towards middle age, middle school children. Telling them it's possible for two men to be in love and one man to get pregnant. Listen, we've also got ele elementary school teachers, ages kindergarten to third grade, teaching gender identity. One, one elementary school teacher used this thing called a gender bread person. 
talking about how this genderbred person doesn't necessarily have a gender, so they can choose. And their mind may tell them they're a different gender than what they are physically. I don't have a soapbox, but I'm about to make one. If a Christian teacher can't pray and post scripture in their classroom, then same-sex transgender teachers should not be able to force their beliefs. God forbid Paige posts Psalm 139 on her board. They throw her under the jail. But let somebody teach this garbage to their children and it's protected. Come on now. Lord. This is even more sickening. Drag queen story hour. She have people bringing their children to see sick, twisted, perverted men dressed up as women reading books to their babies and telling them it's okay to be gay. It's okay to not know what you are. It's okay if you don't agree. Yeah, oh, good God Almighty, help me. And then you've got the left who is over here trying to pass legislation that kids can choose their own genders and get gender surgery without parental consent. Mm -hmm. It's happening all over the Northeast. Go read about it. They're pushing this on our kids. They're getting, listen, if the devil can't kill them in the womb, he's doing his best to kill them in the classroom. He's doing his best to get them in every avenue he can and put their sick, twisted ideology in their minds. But I've come here to put the devil on notice today and say, get your hands off our children. I've come today to let every principality and every power and every demon, my children don't belong to you. The next generation does not belong to you. The children belong to the Lord. And let me put somebody else on notice. All you sick, twisted perverts who support this mess, quit forcing your agenda on little children who don't know any better. You're sick, you're twisted, and you need to be shut down. Listen to me. Anybody that forces this on children, God will not hold them guiltless. He said, if you offend one of these little ones, it's better that a millstone were tied around your neck and you were thrown into the depths of the sea. God will not hold people guiltless who try to offend small children. God will always vote in favor of two genders, male and female. He created them. What? Male and female. Just as the Bible knows nothing of homosexual marriage, the Bible knows nothing of transgenderism. Because there's only two Genders to choose from. Yes, and you are designated at birth. Yes, Lord, we are. Yes, amen. Yes. I hope somebody's praying for me. Amen. You got this. See, God created the family. And He decided what it should be, why it would be, and how it should be. God owns the family, not the government. That's right. amen. He owns it. And anybody, listen. Anybody that votes in favor of transgenderism or the LGBTQ plus agenda, you're voting against God. Yes, come on. Yes, amen. When the government chooses to redefine marriage, sexuality, and gender, they're choosing to trump God. We as kingdom voters must prioritize the family. We must prioritize life. And we must prioritize traditional marriage and traditional gender. Are y'all hearing me this morning? The third thing, if God was to vote, he'd vote in favor of freedom. See, God's purpose for civil government is to maintain a safe, just, righteous, and compassionately responsible environment for freedom to flourish through limited regulations. See, God is where freedom first began. 
Go back to the garden. He told Adam, you can eat of every other tree but one. All of them are yours. Eat the apple tree, eat the pear tree, eat the plum tree, go eat the pineapples. What? But there's one tree, Adam, that you don't touch. He gave him maximum freedom with limited regulation. See, God's definition of civil government is to maintain freedom with limited regulation. That means they do not have the God-given authority to limit our freedom. See, you were in civics and government and, and in history, American history one-on-one. You know the foundations of our nations is the land of the free. The Constitution and the Bill of Rights lays out our freedom and explicitly says man should be able to live their lives unimpended by the government. That's what it says. We have freedom of speech. We have freedom right to bear arms. We have freedom. Listen, do you know we have freedom to gather and protest the government? Our founding fathers never intended for tyranny in America. Read your constitution and your bill of rights. But the sad part about it is we have a group of individuals who have decided to redefine our nation and limit our freedoms. Oh, my freedom's not limited. Yes, it is. Try and post something on Facebook they don't like. They'll shut you down in a minute. They're probably going to take this one off, so I'm glad you're here. Because you probably won't get to hear it again. Post something they don't agree with, they'll take that's an infringement of freedom of speech. Yes, it is. Come on, and if they don't agree with it, they call it hate speech. That's a stupid terminology. No such thing. But let me tell you something else. And you may not even recognize or notice this. One freedom that is specifically being attacked is the freedom of religion. Yes. Religious freedom is under attack. They want to, listen, there is legislation on one particular side, you take a guess which, that is trying to limit religion in America and has actually defined some conservative religions as domestic terrorists. Oh yes, it's out there. And they're trying their best to push it. They want to silence us. Can I tell you that's exactly how communism begins? Yes, it is. Yes. One particular side hates that we have one nation under God on our currency. They hate God. They don't want God in our society because they're Marxist, they're communist, and they're fascist. And the foundation of Marxism, communism, and fascism is get God out of the country. Go read your history. That's what they do. Stalin, Hitler, Mussolini, all the rest of them either limited religion or did away with it altogether. Yes, that's right. And that's what they want. They want to limit our religious freedom. And listen, that one particular side is okay with religious liberty as long as it does not involve Christian values. Let them be a Buddhist, let them be a Muslim, let them be a Hindu, and they're fine with it. But God forbid we pray in public and they're ready to sue us and shut us down. Come on. Yes, preach it. I'm going to say it and I don't care who it makes mad. If you don't believe it's under attack, go look on social media where at one particular rally, two students said Jesus is Lord and that candidate said, you're at the wrong rally. Honey, I'm here to tell you, Jesus is Lord whether you recognize him as Lord or not. And I dare you to tell me I can't worship Jesus. I dare you to tell me not to speak his name. I dare you to threaten my life because he is Lord. I'm going to just go ahead and say it. I'm going to go ahead and say it. They call us Christian nationalists. That's what they call us. That's nothing but an intimidation tactic. Because if you look up the term Christian nationalist, Google will tell you Christian nationalists are domestic terrorists. That's what they say. You want to know who they define as Christian nationalists? Me and you. Yes, yes it is. It's true. See, <laughs> this is going to be the statement that gets me taken off Facebook and YouTube. 
Freedom of religion is a God-given right, yet Democrats seem to believe it is a government-given privilege. Come on. Uh, uh -huh. brother, uh -huh. you I said it. You're right, I said it. I told you I'm sick and tired of stuff being shoved down our throats and us not saying nothing. I'm sick and tired of us taking a beating and us being pushed down. I will not be silenced anymore. Freedom of religion is a God-given right. Choose who you want to worship, but I'm going to worship the one. And God help you if you try to stop me. Because I'm going to be like Daniel, who refuses to bow. Throw me in the lion's den. I'm going to be like the three Hebrew boys. I refuse to bow. Throw me in the furnace. I'm going to be like Paul, who stood in the face of the test and was beaten and scourged. Go ahead and beat me. Go ahead and threaten me with death. You're just threatening me with a greater reward. I will die for him because he died for me. God will always vote in favor of life. He will vote in favor of marriage. And he will vote in favor of freedom. Yes, Anytime the government, I got to hurry. Anytime the government seeks to set maximum regulation and limit freedom, they are putting themselves in the place of God. And God will not allow anybody to take his throne. That's right. Are y'all hearing me this morning? Yes. He'd vote for freedom. But he'd also vote for Israel. I'm on, this is going to be a short point, but I got to make it. Genesis 12 and 3, I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse those who curse you. When you vote on Tuesday, you've got to vote pro-Israel. Because if you vote anti-Israel, you're voting against God. And if you vote anti-Israel, you are welcoming a curse, not only on this nation, but on your family and on your life. The is Israel is God's people. You don't have to agree with them. You don't have to like their government, but they're his people. And I'm going to stand with God's people. I'm standing with Israel because I stand with God. Yes, come on. God votes in favor of life, family, freedom, Israel, and last but not least, he votes in favor of justice and righteousness. The scriptures say righteousness and justice are the foundation of your throne. Righteousness and justice are the twin towers of God's kingdom. Righteousness means the standard of right and wrong that has been established by God. See, we, don't, we, cannot, we do not get the right to define righteousness. That means we do not have the privilege of defining what is good and what is evil. Y'all hear me? Amen. We cannot say this is good and this is evil. No, God has already set that standard. Yes, amen. Yes. And God help us if we call good evil and evil good. Righteousness is the standard that God has set of right and wrong. And justice is the equitable and impartial application of God's law in society. Yes. Here's the way to explain it. Justice is the standard by which judgment is distributed. That's right. You hear me? Justice is fair and equitable treatment, and it is fair and equitable judgment. Yes, it is. See, Deuteronomy says all of God's ways are justice. With, there's no injustice in him. He is righteous and upright. You shall do no injustice in judgment. You shall not be partial to the poor nor honor the mighty. In righteousness you shall judge. See, God does not play favorites. Amen. He does not play favorites. No. He doesn't let me get away with things that he don't let you get away with. Amen. He holds us all to the same standard. Yes, he does. Chronicles tells us there's no iniquity in the Lord. There's no favoritism with him. His law is the law regardless of who you are. Amen. That means as kingdom voters, we've got to vote in favor of righteousness and justice. That means we've got to vote in favor of equality. Yes, we See, there's no distinction between Jew and Greeks. There's neither Greek nor Jew, circumcised, uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave nor free, but Christ is in all and for all. Don't tell me you're pro-choice and you're racist. Amen. 
Come on. That's a good point, Brother Drake. Thank you. I think it is. Yes, Don't tell me all lives matter when you're okay with racial discrimination. Come on. He loves them all. Red, yellow, black, and white. They are precious in his sight. Amen. That's a good place to say amen. amen. Come on. We have to vote for equality. But we also have to vote for law and order. See, God is not a God of disorder, but peace. And everything should be done, what, decently and in order. That means we vote for those people who uphold law and order. Therefore, our law enforcement. Therefore, our military. And I'm going to make a statement here that, that really is going to get on somebody's nerves. But that means we also vote for border security. Yeah. Come on. Preach, brother. Come on. Well, this is the land of the free because of the brave, and we were all immigrants. Yeah, but we came here legally. Amen. I've got the papers of my great, great, great something grandfather who came over from England, and he had to be vetted, and he had to go through a process. He was an immigrant, but he came here legally. Come on now. I'm going to be careful because they will take me off if I say what I know. But she even saw today where there was a young girl that was murdered by an illegal immigrant. Two. They were a gang. Be careful, Drake. Be careful. We have to vote for security. Because there are people who hate this nation, who hate us, who are doing their best to get in here and undermine our foundations and destroy us. We vote for law and order. But we also vote for equitable treatment. That means we don't allow the rich to get away with something that the poor wouldn't. Just listen. I'm sick and tired of politicians and politicians' daughters and sons getting away with stuff that they would throw me and you under the jail for. Amen. Come on. That's right. I'm sick and tired of uh, our people getting arrested for, for little things and spending 20 to 30 years in jail, but you've got a sitting president's son who was doing illegal stuff with, with hateful people overseas, and they patted him on the butt and said, don't do it again, and they let him go. Come on. Yeah. Yes, that's right. That's fine. Y'all don't have to like it. It's fine. Proverbs 11 one says, dishonest scales are what? An abomination. Yes. Diverse weights are an abomination. Dishonest scales are not good. God is all for equity. He is all for a fair trial and equitable judgment. See, we have to vote in favor of righteousness and justice. Come on, Misty, I'm almost done. Righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. You want to make America great again? then vote for, faith, vote for righteousness and justice. Amen. I'm not endorsing a candidate. I'm just using their, their catchphrase. If we want America to be exalted, we have to vote in favor of God's law. Come on. See, as we prepare to vote on Tuesday, we have to, number one, keep in mind who we represent. We do not represent Republican and we do not re represent Democrat. We represent the kingdom. Yes, amen. We represent one and we are under the authority of one and that is Jesus Christ the Lord. But, unfortunately Jesus is not on the ballot. Unfortunately he's not a selection on Tuesday so we have to vote for one or the other. And the problem is neither one of them is perfect. Neither one of them are the epitome of of a perfect leader, but hear me, we are not voting for a pastor in chief. That's right. We're not voting a pastor. We're voting a president. Mm -hmm. Listen, we're not voting for personality, we're voting for policy. That's right. And policy matters because people matter. Yes, amen. Because policy affects people. Yes, amen. Listen. We've got to learn to stand up for righteousness, truth, justice, family, life, the policies that matter to God. Because we are responsible for preserving truth and preserving the nation. 
Are y'all hearing me? Yes, Matthew 5, 13, you're salt of the earth. Yes, we are. Come on. Salt preserves. You and I are responsible for preserving our nation and preserving our freedom. Yes, amen. Trent, I don't want to be sitting in a rocking chair 50 years from now and my three girls look at me and say, Daddy, why didn't you say something? Mm. Oh, come on. I don't want, Mary Caitlin, for me to be an old man under tyranny, under fascism, socialism, under all this mess. And my oldest daughter said, you coward, why didn't you stand up and say something? Listen, you say, this is not the America I grew up in. Maybe it would be if we quit backing down. Listen, if we'll step up, Goliath will step back. If we'll step up, then all of that mess has to take a step back because light drives out darkness. Yes, it does. You and me are responsible for the future of this nation. Yes, we are. And let me tell you, God's not going to hold us guiltless if we decide to be indecisive. I'm reminded of the story, and I promise you I'm, I'm finishing, but I, I told you I'm going to preach it. I'm going to get it out of my system. Go read the book of Esther. I'm going to paraphrase it for you. Mordecai came to Esther and said, Esther, there is legislation. I'm going to put it in modern terms. He said, Esther, there is legislation from the government that if it's passed and if it is implemented, all Jews will be killed. And he said, Mordecai said, sister, it's time to cast your vote. It's time to take a side and cast your vote. But Esther, sister Teresa, was undecided. She said, well, you know, if I approach the king without being invited, I could be killed. I don't know what I'm, we don't know how this is going to shake out, Mordecai. So I don't know if I'm going to make a decision or take action at all. And Mordecai said, whether you choose to act or not to act, you were chosen for such a time as this. And he said, if you choose not to act, God will raise up somebody else, but he won't hold you guiltless. It's time to cast your ballot for one side or the other. See, (laughs) Statistics tell us that 1.4 million conservative Christians will sit out on Tuesday and not vote. I was in the room, and I'll tell you who it was, I don't care. I was in the room with Donald Trump last Monday, and he said these words. He said, Christians are the most indecided voters, and they hurt the vote every time. Yes, come on. Not because they vote, but because they choose not to. Amen. Come on. Listen, don't sit there and gripe about the nation if you didn't vote. That's right. Come on, come on, free brother. Don't sit there and complain about who's in the White House if you didn't cast your ballot to put your choice in there. Amen. See, it's time for us to quit sitting back and quit being indecisive. I gave you enough truth that should light a fire under your rear end and get you at the polls early Tuesday morning and vote. Yes, amen. Because listen, Diedrich Bonhoeffer said this, silence in the face of evil is evil itself. God will not hold us guiltless. Not to speak is to speak and not to act is to act. Yes. Not to vote is to vote. That's right. You ready, me? So, I've come here today for one purpose and one purpose only. I'm telling the church it's time to stand up. I don't have a, I don't have a national platform and I don't need one. I have enough platform right here and enough influence right here that I believe if we'll pray, if we'll fast, and if we'll vote, God can change the course of this nation. Yes, amen. But listen, He will only do so when the church acts. That's right. So here's my clarion call for you today. You've got to vote in favor of God. I'm not going to tell you who to vote for, what sign to vote for. That is your freedom to choose. But you are obligated as a Christian. You are obligated as a blood-bought believer to vote in favor of life, to vote in favor of the family, to vote in favor of freedom, to vote in favor of justice and righteousness, and vote in favor of Israel. We have to vote and we have to pray. That's all we've been obligated to do. 
So here's what we're going to do. I want you to stand with me this morning. Brother David, you can shut off the video. Here's what.